Hello, welcome to Wet Pixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon, and I'm the publisher of Wet Pixel, and I'm joined by our, our resident expert, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hey, Adam. Nice to see you. Always uh, good to be here. Yeah, how have you been? Yeah, good, thanks. Yep, yeah, been good. underwater since we last recorded one of these, so it's always a nice feeling. Oh, there's nothing, nothing better, really, particularly in these times when we don't get to be underwater as much as we might like. Yeah. Um, so today we're going to discuss a topic or ask a question really, um, how do we look after our systems um, when we're in the field? Um, and obviously by systems we mean lights, cameras, strobes, the whole, action. The whole yeah, yeah, action, housings, the whole business. So, um, and I think, um, Alex, you mentioned that you'd read a bit about this in Martin Edge's book. Did you want to expand on, on what you'd read? Yeah, it was just, um, as we discussed in one of the, the recent episodes of Wet Pixel Live, the fifth edition of, of Martin Edge's book, The Underwater Photographer, is, is out now. And, you know, despite knowing lots about underwater photography, I think we can always learn more. Sure. And so I was, I was particularly keen to read parts of that. And I'd never read an article by Kevin Reed before, who runs a company in the UK that specializes in servicing underwater camera equipment called Aquashot. And he'd written an article about looking after your gear. And so that kind of really piqued my curiosity. And that in, in Martin's book, he talks about three deadly sins, which I think are a pretty good place to start today. Yeah. The three deadly sins that he feels underwater photographers make that he ends up having to fix up after the fact. So his first deadly sin is allowing salt crystals to form on your housing. Yeah. And um, there's kind of two cures for that. One is, is to not let it dry out, which you see is a very good short-term fix. And then wet. the other is, is to make sure when it does dry out, it's not covered in salt water. And, uh, so I think the, the important thing to, 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 to about salt crystals is obviously as salt crystallizes, effectively it expands. So if there are any soft parts in the way, like O-rings, and this can be both external and internal within the, the buttons, for example, on the housing, it can get in there and it can expand and um, and damage the rubber, the, the soft parts of the seal. Um, and, and also with hard things, obviously seize them up as well. But yeah, that's yeah. in process. So, so the, 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 but as you mentioned, the, the important thing here is while the salt is still in solution, i.e. still dissolved, it doesn't matter. So as long as your housing's wet, um, you know, it, it, it's fine. It's when it dries out that it becomes an issue. And, mm -hmm. and oftentimes, I think on trips, people often spend an inordinate amount of time rinse, religiously rinsing housings the whole time to get the salt off. If your housing is going to stay wet, it doesn't. So at the end of the day, when you finish shooting, yes, rinse the housing. But up until that point, as long as it's wet, it's not really going to do any harm. Um, but you're also not going to do any harm rinsing it. But, you know, I don't yeah. think, yeah, I, I'm with you. The number of times I've, I've been on boats, in the pouring rain in the UK, <laughs> you know, where it's, there's not going to be any evaporation, and people are, you know, get, you know, all het up about, oh, we must have a camera rinse bucket on the boat. Yeah. And yeah. Kevin's so. second deadly sin is over greasing O rings. And while I think most of us have a pretty good handle on what O rings are and how they work, I do think people get confused about, particularly when they're starting out, about greasing O rings. And I think the clear message is O ring grease doesn't seal your housing. A nice supple O-ring does, and the grease is simply there to keep that O-ring supple. And actually, it's far more important than greasing your O-ring is, is cleaning any bits off it, because those bits can make it leak. Um, the O-ring grease really just maintains the condition of it. So I'm very lazy when it comes to greasing O-rings. A lot of my O-rings are very old, certainly as old as the housings that they're in. And I tend to just grease the O-rings usually once at the beginning of a trip, and then I probably don't grease them again all trip. I'll clean them off during the trip, but I'm generally not a big O-ring greaser. Yeah. That does vary a bit trip to trip. I think when we're somewhere like Lembe and there's lots of black, black sand, sand going on yeah. the O-rings, they get a lot more care and attention than when I'm liverboard diving in the Red Sea when they never get a grain of sand on them all trip and they generally just get ignored. So yeah, over-greasing O-rings is Kevin's second point. So one of the things I've seen you do, Alex, with O-rings is you pass them through your mouth. Yeah. What are you doing when you're doing that? that one, yeah. All the time, yeah. So, <laughs> um, y yes. When you've been on a dive and there's obviously been some salt water on the O-ring and maybe a bit of dust from when you open the housing, I have to say I have the disgusting habit, and I'm not encouraging it, of I'll <laughs> take an O-ring out and it just needs to be cleaned. Then I just go, sh -sh -sh, and it goes back in. And I don't encourage it, and I'd like to be able to stop myself doing it, but it's just become such a habit that I clean O-rings that way and then afterwards go, oh, that's disgusting. He loves the taste of silicon. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to move you swiftly on to Kevin's yeah. third deadly sin. Wise. The deadly sin isn't licking your O-rings like I do. <laughs> and that's dripping inside your housing. 
And I think Kevin, as someone who repairs housing, sees lots of internal components inside housings damaged by fingers dripping water into the side of the housing and surprisingly common thing but also also opening the back of housings as parts of the housing that do hold water and then that drips on in typically cameras are robust robust enough but some of the circuit boards inside housings now flash triggering circuit boards leak detection and vacuum circuit boards all those things can really get damaged by by those things so so two um, Two points on that. The first thing is wetsuit sleeves are notorious. You know, you've got a wet wetsuit and you come to open up your housing and the wetsuit is dripping into the housing. You see that quite commonly. Um, the, the other problem or potential problem that you've always got with water inside housings, although it may appear a very small amount of, of moisture, as the housing heats up, it, it evap evaporates and that moisture that can then travel around and actually can get into parts of the camera that are sealed. So this is why it's really quite important to make sure we minimize the number of droplets in the housing. So, so bear in mind that we're not dealing here necessarily with droplets of water because if the water becomes vaporized, it will move around and get into bits of the camera that you really don't want it to be in. So, so it's quite important, yeah. yeah. Well, so those are Kevin's sort of three deadly sins. And I know there's another one I'd add to that, which I've learned from you, and I hear you saying this all the time to people on workshops, and that is, if it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it. Yeah. Uh, so many times, you know, if the housing is sealed and it's not leaking, um, which you hope it isn't, um, people will often, almost religiously, every time they open a housing, they, they pull the O-ring out, they examine it, they clean it, you know open the housing, have a good look at the O-ring, inspect it. And in a place like Lembo, where you've got lots of black sand around, for sure, you're good, probably going to have to clean it. Um, although I think with the vacuums, that's changed a lot. But, but, but certainly, you know, you may have to clean it. But if, if, it, if it doesn't, hasn't, isn't dirty, don't clean it. And you can see that by eye. Um, if it doesn't need grease, don't grease it. So it's not, the, the, you know, unlike... Um, a situation where you're doing a regular maintenance inspection and doing a series of steps, really what this requires you to have a look at the O-ring, look at the state of the O-ring and decide then what you're going to do. Um, once the O-ring's in place and sealing, there's every likelihood it's going to do the same thing again. So um, as long as there's nothing in it to make it make it leak. Um, I, I often find also as well, people will do things like, you know, there's a port, so they don't change ports between dives. So they've got the user, sorry, they don't change lenses using the same lens combination, and yet they'll take the port off and clean the O-ring and grease it. It's sealed, it's in there, it's not leaking, leave it be, don't touch it. O obviously, once you then decide to change lenses and put different ports on, then you have got to go through the whole inspection process again. But there's no, there's nothing, to, there's no advantage to be gained by um, removing and inspecting O-rings when they're, when they're not being changed. Um, yeah. You're not changing things on the housing. I think one thing I'd pick up on that is the fact that, you know, an O-ring should just have a nice sheen to it. You should never be able to see any grease on it. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think that's where my, my saliva thing sort of comes in. You know, an O-ring should look like it's just been licked. You know? <laughs> but not with your tongue, with proper O-ring grease applied at a very thin level. There we are. Um, I I'm, I'm a little bit different to, to Adam in that I actually open and close my housing the whole time. Yeah. And I, uh, the reason I do that is I find I shoot best when I'm changing my lens regularly. Um, I find actually if I start doing too many dives in a row with the same lens, creatively I get a little bit bored and I tend not to be that. My photography tends to suffer as a result. So I'm a big one for opening my housing. And I will open my housing anywhere, even on a little rubber dinghy. I'm quite happy opening my housing, changing lenses. For me, it's not about having this perfect camera room or this, you know, sort of um, sort of perfectly germ-free environment to change my housing. It's about how much attention I'm paying to it when I'm changing things over. Yeah. So for me, that's that's a really big thing. Um, and I like to change my lens. And I think it comes a little bit from, from when I, sh obviously for years, shooting on film. When we shot film, we had to open our housings after every dive. And I've just really got used to that. And I think a lot of my early diving was also in the Cayman Islands, which most of the dive trips there are two tank trips. So I was always on boats doing two tank trips and therefore just got in the habit of happily opening my housing. So I, I tend to do that a lot. I think the last thing that I'd like to talk about is the difference that vacuum seals have yeah, made. Yeah, vacuums, yeah. And a point yeah. you made in that, which is actually sort of a side point, but it's quite an interesting one, is we definitely noticed in Lembe is that one advantage of the vacuum seal, irrespective of, of the main ones, is that a vacuum actually holds housings much more tightly closed than, than ambient pressure. It actually pre-compresses the O-ring, doesn't it? Yeah, so, and yeah. we found, we, we definitely noticed that that means you actually get a lot less sand going into your O-ring grooves 
on on dives now than before. In the old days, you used to do a dive in Lembe and there'd be a, a trail of sand all the yeah. way around your O-ring. Yeah. And these days, you, if you have the, the housing vacuumed up, you hardly get any sand on the O-ring. Yeah. And so in the old days, I'd say if you went you know, black sand diving, you were cleaning your O-rings after almost every dive. Now, I'm often, you know, it's often a week and I won't clean them because no sand gets in there. But yeah. the main advantage of, of having a vacuum is, Adam, <laughs> well, well, I mean, what what the the vacuum does, and I think this is probably an important point, is is the vacuum proves that you've assembled the housing correctly. So, so for me, certainly, I I assemble the housing, put it all together, pull a vacuum, and it's holding the vacuum. To be honest, after five minutes, it's holding enough vacuum, and that's it. Then I know that I have assembled the housing correctly and it's sealed. And that, to me, is the, what a vacuum does. Now, of course, the great advantage of that is if I am out on a boat somewhere and changing lenses, then it gives me a, a, a physical test that I have remembered to put it back together correctly. But the, the, the real thing about it, for me, with vacuums is we shouldn't rely on the vacuum to ensure that we assemble the housing correctly. Um, we should assemble the housing correctly and get the vacuum to double check us, not the other way around. Um, and I think there's the, one of the problems with vacuums is people could come to rely on them a bit, which is fine until you're in a situation where you are out of the boat and you've forgotten the pump. Um, and then you can't, you can no longer pump your vacuum. What do you do? You know, I, I well, there's some videos of me online, I think, show you what you have to do when you get in that situation. There are, um, um, yeah. but the uh, but the, the, the point being that I've also had people say they don't want to dive because they can't pull a vacuum, and that strikes me as being a great shame. You know, you, you spend a lot of time, effort, and possibly money in getting to a place. And then you're not prepared to dive because you don't trust your own judgment and whether you've actually sealed the housing up correctly. We dived for years without vacuums and the majority of the time didn't flood cameras. So it's quite possible to do. Um, and if you're doing it right, the vacuum just solves that you're doing things right. So you know, if, you, if your vacuum is held perfectly for the past 100 dives, then there's every likelihood if you don't pull a vacuum, it will still hold. You know, it's, you're probably doing it right. So um, I, th I think it's important not to become reliant on the vacuum as, a, as something that we need in order to make sure that we can dive. Um, I think there's some really good points there, Alex. I think we've covered um, what we need to cover about our, our maintenance of housings in the field and how we, how we look after our systems in the field. Um, I know um, at the moment none of us are travelling very much, Alex, but um, where can people go for some inspiration to see where um, to, to, to get some inspiration for their next travelling adventure? Um, well, I, I think that, you know, my favorite places to look at images online are Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. I think some of the big groups on Facebook are fantastic for that. Yeah. And um, personally, if you like following individual photographers, I really love Instagram. And even if you're not necessarily going to the most exciting places, it's always great to get some inspiration. So you can follow me at Alex Mustard One on Instagram. Yep. But get out there and follow lots of people. It's, it's you know, it's lots to enjoy. Great. Thanks for that, Alex. Um, thank you all for watching this episode. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsor, which is Backscatter Photo and Video. Um, please subscribe to the channel if you like what you've seen, add likes and add comments, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.